All righty. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our summer lecture, Witch Trials and Antisemitism, A Surprisingly Tangled History. My name is Rachel Christone. I'm the Director of Education here at the Salem Witch Museum. And I'm Jill Christensen, the Assistant Education Director. Uh, so as always, uh, same format as usual. We are going to turn off our camera during the presentation so you can see the full uh, PowerPoint screen. We will turn it back on at the end for the Q&A. We are recording this presentation and it will be shared to our website and our YouTube page tomorrow. Um, where our hope, our goal is that this talk will be about 45 minutes, it may be a little bit longer, and we will have time for questions and discussion at the end of the presentation. And we would like to thank our co-sponsor for this event, Voices Against Injustice. Created in 1992 during the Salem Witch Trials Tercentenary, Voices Against Injustice is an activist organization which presents the annual Salem Award to uh, Champions of Human Rights. They oversee the Salem Witch Trials Memorial here in Salem, and they strive to inspire members of our worldwide community to confront fear and social injustice with courage. And if you're looking for more information on this wonderful organization and the important work they do in our community, please visit their website, which is voicesagainstinjustice.org. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. The mission of our museum is to be the voice of the innocent victims of witch hunts from 1692 to the present day. While the majority of our museum focuses on historic witch trials, we also seek to connect the lessons of these tragic events with more contemporary history and experiences. At the end of our exhibit, which is Evolving Perceptions, we present a formula for a witch hunt that can help explain the events of 1692 as well as three modern examples of scapegoating during a time of escalated panic. The internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, the communist blacklists of the 1940s and 1950s, and the AIDS epidemic of the 1980s, which was largely blamed on the gay community. Over the years, we have had numerous visitors come up to our tour guides at the end of this exhibit who ask why the Holocaust is not included on this wall. The reason is this display focuses on events from 20th century American history. However, this example certainly follows the witch hunt pattern. Escalated fear and anger in Germany following the loss of World War I, triggered by the rise of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party, led to the scapegoating of Jewish people on a massive scale. As a result, six million European Jews were murdered. While Jewish individuals were not the only people targeted by this violence, the German propaganda campaign systematically targeted Jews, describing them as the reason for Germany's troubles. Jews were described as subhuman or an alien race that poisoned Germany, destroying its economy and weakening its citizenry through interfaith marriage. It was their fault, said the Nazi party, that Germany had lost World War I, and the danger remained as international Jewish financiers inside and outside of Europe would only continue to push for another world war. Unfortunately, this behavior was nothing new. Describing Jewish individuals as part of a conspiracy, one bent on destroying Christian society, or finding them at fault for a variety of random acts of misfortune is a behavior that has been going on for many, many centuries. In fact, the stories that were told about Jews in the medieval period included allegations that closely matched the claims later made against witches. Before witchcraft became a scapegoat for misfortune in Europe, it was Jews who were thought to be demonic and were said to poison wells, spread plague, and eat children. Today's program is an event we have envisioned for years, as the history of witchcraft and anti-Semitism have shocking similarities. Today, we will be diving into these connections, focusing on the parallel stories and accusations brought against first Jews and later witches. Unfortunately, this talk is now more relevant than ever. Most of you are likely aware there's been a significant rise in anti-Semitism in the United States in recent years. Anti-Semitic rhetoric, graffiti, and hate crimes are on the rise. 
In March of 2023, the FBI released a supplement to its 2021 hate crime statistics report, which stated that 51% of reported religion-related hate crime incidents took place against Jews. According to the F Anti-Defamation League, anti-Semitic incidents reached an all-time high in the United States in 2021. These incidents included vandalism, harassment, and a 167% rise in physical assaults. It is now more than ever important to consider what the lessons of the past have to teach us. The behavior we see exhibited in the modern day is unfortunately nothing new and is yet another iteration of scapegoating during a time of escalated tension. Now, as we start this presentation, I would like to share that I, Rachel, am Jewish, and this research has been particularly poignant for me. Having grown up in a Jewish community, I was of course aware of the horrors of anti-Semitism and the long-lasting stereotypes that continue to this day. However, as I dove into this research, I was shocked by what I found. I was aware there are certain connections between the historic mistreatment of Jews and witches. Both are stories of innocent people who were demonized because of their perceived role as outsiders. However, it was not until I became engrossed in this research that I became aware of the extent to which these histories are tangled. We are very glad to have the opportunity to bring additional awareness to this history and to hopefully contribute to or help to begin conversations about this important subject. We want to take a moment and define some important vocabulary words. Merriam-Webster defines a scapegoat as, quote, one that bears the blame for others or one that is the object of irrational hostility, unquote. More plainly put, this term refers to unwarranted blame directed at a group of innocent people. For our purposes, we can understand the term witch hunt to mean a person or group of people who are scapegoated. To very briefly define Judaism, and please bear in mind, it is largely an impossible task to define any religion in just a sentence or two. We can broadly understand Judaism as a monotheistic religion, meaning it recognizes the existence of one all-powerful God. These individuals live in accordance with scriptures and rabbinic traditions, following the teachings of the Pentateuch, commonly referred to as the Old Testament. This religion has its roots in the Middle East and is considered one of the oldest monotheistic religions. And finally, the Anti-Defamation League defines anti-Semitism as, quote, prejudice or discrimination against Jews as individuals and as a group. Anti-Semitism is based on stereotypes and legends that target Jews as a people, their religious practices and beliefs, and the Jewish state of Israel, unquote. I do want to comment. I just saw in the chat, somebody's having trouble with audio, but I see that I think everybody else can still hear us. Can somebody just confirm everyone can hear the audio before we get half an hour into the presentation? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so it, uh, if there's an individual issue, uh, it is on your end, unfortunately, and there, it will be recorded. So, all right. So getting back to it. So we should also clarify that we are not experts on the history of Judaism or anti-Semitism. This is an incredibly complicated topic, which one which goes far beyond the parameters of our presentation today. However, as always, we have conducted careful research as we prepared for this presentation. So on screen here, we can see uh, some of the sources that we uh, consulted for this lecture. Now we're gonna show this slide again at the end of the presentation for those wishing to jot down some of these titles or looking for recommended reading. We would also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Magda Tedder of Fordham University for her willingness to generously share her knowledge. Our road to meeting Professor Tedder was kind of a fortuitous journey. This year, I had the opportunity to speak before the Women's Rabbinic Network at their annual convention. As this year's meeting was hosted in Beverly, I was asked to give a lecture about the local history of witchcraft trials and their enduring connections to the modern day. I'm very grateful to Rabbi Rennie Altman, who connected us with Professor Tedder when I asked if she knew anyone who could potentially review this lecture for us. Professor Tedder kindly agreed and provided very helpful commentary and suggested revisions. We are very grateful for her help and highly recommend her recent book, 
Christian Supremacy, Reckoning with Roots of Antisemitism and Racism, for those who are wishing to learn more about this complicated and important subject. Now, before we move on, please be advised, these are really difficult topics, and we will be showing several images that include anti-Semitic imagery. We will show numerous images from the medieval, early modern period, and present day as a means of illustrating the propaganda used to further anti-Semitic ideas. While this language and imagery is unsettling, it has been included so as to help us understand the extreme aggression and prejudice that has been directed towards these, event, these individuals for centuries. And finally, we would like to emphasize that we are speaking from the perspective of historians as we delve into this subject. It can be difficult to discuss religious history as these are deeply held emotional and personal subjects for many today. Keep in mind, this lecture is based on scholarly analysis regarding how and why these events transpired and beliefs evolved. We are not passing judgment, nor are we attempting to delve into com a complex religious debate. We are instead presenting the facts as discerned by professional historians. While this has been one of the most challenging lectures we have ever composed, we hope this presentation will help to remind us why it is so very essential to continue learning about difficult and emotional history. These events have essential lessons for those of us living in the modern day, and we do ourselves a disservice by shrinking from a subject because it is unfamiliar or daunting. Let's now briefly turn our attention to the history of witchcraft. Societies around the world have long believed in magic, using it for both help and harm. For our purposes, we can understand magic as a set of traditions and rituals that helped to explain the unexplainable and gave a feeling of control or influence in a chaotic world. Though individuals had long been punished or chastised for practicing harmful magic, European society did not begin hunting for witches until about the 15th century. It was during this period that the cumulative concept of a witch emerged. This was a person believed to practice harmful magic, worship the devil, and participate in an insidious secret conspiracy. Witches were envisioned as evil or desperate people who sold their soul to Satan and in return gained magical powers they would use to wage war against Christian society. This was a serious criminal offense that was punishable by death. The emergence of this frightening figure was due to a combination of factors. For example, this was in part the result of an increased effort by the church to crack down on the practice of magic. There was also growing concern about the devil and his powers in the centuries leading up to this period. Over time, various groups were targeted as allegedly part of a hidden conspiracy of devil worshipers, a trend that is important for our subject today. Eventually, religious leaders began writing about and discussing the frightening possibility that individuals were actually capable of selling their souls to the devil and in return, gaining supernatural powers. In short, this is when witch hunts began. Witch trials took place between the 15th century and the 18th centuries during what is known as the early modern period. This was a time of increasing fear and tension across Europe. Outbreaks of the Black Plague, devastating wars, religious tensions brought on by the Protestant Reformation and Catholic Counter-Reformation, and changes in the weather were just a few of the factors which made everyday life tough and uncertain. Witchcraft accusations frequently followed an act of random misfortune and could quickly erupt into a full-blown witchcraft panic if left unchecked by local authorities. While anybody could be accused of witchcraft, man, woman, or child, a certain kind of person tended to be the most vulnerable to suspicion. These were often the individuals who pushed against social barriers or made those around them feel uncomfortable. For example, women who publicly fought with their husbands or their neighbors, were widowed and living alone, were independently employed as a midwife or healer, or had done something scandalous, were particularly susceptible to witchcraft accusations. Though estimates vary, approximately 90,000 individuals were prosecuted for witchcraft-related crimes, and about 45,000 people were executed during this period. About 75% of those targeted were women. Now, it's important to understand that those accused of being a witch were innocent people. 
While some may have practiced folk magic, there is no evidence to suggest these individuals were actually trying to sell their soul to the devil and wage war against Christian society. These people were instead convenient scapegoats for any number of problems, such as the death of a child, a sudden decline in health, or a destructive turn in the weather. Over time, legal witch trials came to an end, but stories lingered on. A stereotype of a witch formed based on the stories, legends, and allegations that circulated throughout Europe during the witch trials period. Of course, today we are very familiar with what we might call the stereotypical witch. This is a woman, usually though not always older and ugly, who wears a pointed hat, flies through the air on a broomstick, lures children into her candy covered house so she may eat them and cooks over a bubbling cauldron. This is the figure that has stayed with us in popular culture, a shadow of the stories that once haunted the minds of thousands. Before Europeans hunted witches, seeing these evildoers as the source of their trouble and suffering, suspicion was often directed toward religious minorities such as Jews. Jews have faced persecution since the very inception of this religion. For example, before Christ, the Hebrews, the early Jewish people, were sometimes persecuted because they refused to adopt the religion of the local ruler. However, anti-Jewish sentiment intensified as Christianity became a solidified religion. The origins of this aggression are complex. For example, this was in part grounded in rhetoric that viewed Jews as collectively at fault for the death of Jesus. This view was based in a section of the New Testament, which states that the crucifixion of, Ju of Jesus was agreed upon by the crowd of Jewish onlookers who said, quote, his blood be on us and on our children, unquote. According to historian William Brustein, quote, Thus begins the Christian conception of the collective responsibility of Jews for the death of Jesus, a conception that would gain momentum in the sermons and writings of the fourth century Christian writers, unquote. Again, this is a very complicated subject, one which we do not have the ability to delve into in its entirety. However, ideas about Christian superiority over Jews grew over time, eventually leading to the legal degradation of Jews in the medieval period. So that is not to say Jews were treated badly universally across Christian Europe. There were times and places where Jews were accepted, at least to some degree, into communities and lived peacefully. However, Jews were increasingly seen as subordinates to Christians. Slowly, legal limitations were placed on their freedom. So for example, in the Roman Empire, the first explicit ban on Jews holding public office was as early as 418. Seven years later, they were also prohibited from serving as lawyers. As time went on, Jews were prohibited from owning Christian slaves or employing Christian servants, from marrying Christians, and were prevented from appearing as witnesses against Christians in court. In 1555, Pope Paul IV issued the papal decree Cum Nimis Absurdum, which, among other restrictions, officially sanctioned the confinement of Jews under his dominion to a particular street or quarter, creating sanctioned Jewish ghettos. Here we can see an illustration of a Jewish ghetto in Venice, Italy. In the places where Jews remained, their professional opportunities became increasingly limited. In certain areas, Jews were not allowed to own land, restricting farming as a profession, and they were also frequently banned from craftsmen and merchant guilds. They were, however, often permitted to engage in certain professions that were seen as less favorable to the ruling classes. They often worked as tax collectors, money lenders, peddlers, and managers of estates. Money lending was eventually condemned by the church as a sin for Christians, and the church began to encourage a negative connotation. As noted by Sarah Lipton in her article, Jews and Money, quote, preachers began to tell anecdotes about deceitful Jewish misers who consorted with the devil, villains with distinctively fleshy and bestial features. The aim was to intensify the negative connotations of Jew and thereby create a more negative attitude towards usury so that it would be shunned by Christians, unquote. The tendency to fulfill this profession, among other factors, eventually contributed to a stereotype. 
according to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. This included the idea that, quote, Jews did not work hard or produce goods with their own hands. Jews chose to work with money and to trade in goods because of their skills, their greed, and their desire to manipulate and cheat Christians. Jews preferred meaningless study and frivolous entertainment to hard creative work. Jews were insincere and potentially disloyal in that they converted to Christianity to obtain material benefits. Jews were cowards in a fair fight and avoided military service, unquote. With these legal limitations and growing social distrust also came sinister stories about the alleged evil deeds of Jews, who were increasingly seen as distrustful, sinister, and eventually demonic. Illustrations depicting Jews with, depicted Jews with horns and cloven feet, libelous allegations that Jews ritually murdered children, desecrated host wafers, and spread plague circulated across Europe. Let us now consider the overlap between the accusations brought against Jews and witches. As we will see, the same stories that followed European Jews for centuries were often reused in the early modern period to describe the actions of witches. We'll start with accusations of blood libel or the false accusations that Jews murder Christian children. It's important to note stories of cannibalism and murder are often used to vilify fringe or distrusted groups in the past and present day. The Romans made these allegations about early Christians. Fringe Christian groups like the Cathars were accused of these depraved acts by the medieval church. Today, we see these same accusations brought up again in many cases to vilify political leaders. The recurrence of these stories makes sense at least on some level. These are stories used to demonize others, those who are different and whose difference feels threatening. Murder, particularly child murder and cannibalism are some of the worst crimes imaginable. By accusing someone of these crimes, you are stripping them of their humanity, of their right for empathy. It's difficult to date the first accusations that a Jewish person had killed a child for ritual purposes, though historians often point to an incident which allegedly took place in Norwich, England in 1144. According to the story, a young boy's body was found in the woods around Easter. Sources would later claim that some believe Jews had attempted to crucify the child as a way to express their abhorrence for Jesus, though there is no record of a subsequent trial or punishment. Another incident was reported in 1255 when a nine-year-old boy known as Little Hugh of Lincoln died. Unlike the previous case, this accusation resulted in the execution of nearly 20 local Jews who were blamed for the tragedy. This would become a famous story and is still referenced by anti-Semitists today. Of course, here we can see the beginning of a pattern. The mysterious untimely death of a child could be blamed on Jews, providing a scapegoat to the bereaved family and community. By the 13th century, the story was expanded to include the idea that Jews were killing Christian children specifically to obtain their blood for ritual purposes. We should note these accusations were condemned by church and secular authorities for centuries. For example, in 1247, Jewish leaders appealed to Pope Innocent IV after a Christian girl was found dead and Jews were tortured and burned at the stake by enraged locals. The Pope denounced this, per denounced this persecution a stance that popes in the following centuries would maintain. However, this papal protection would come to an end following a particularly notorious incident in Trent, Italy in 1475. As in previous cases, accusations began following the discovery of a deceased child. In this case, it was the body of a toddler named Simon, discovered in a canal under a Jewish house. Moreover, the body was found in March, close to Easter and Passover, underscoring the belief that ritual sacrifices took place during this season. This led to an unusually lengthy trial and ultimately the torture and execution of nearly all the male Jews in this small community. The fear generated by this case was significant and ultimately ended papal defense of Jews. By the 15th century, stories of blood libel were extended to describe the behavior of the latest heretical threat, witches. I'm sure we're all familiar with the idea that witches eat children. 
That's a stereotype that has remained with the folkloric witch for centuries. On screen here, we can see an image of the famous children's story, Hansel and Gretel. Of course, the witch in this story is attempting to devour two innocent children, luring them to their demise with her candy covered house. This trope in folklore is based on real stories brought against thousands during the witch trials period. Individuals accused of witchcraft were frequently said to have murdered and consumed children. As was the case with previous Jewish accusations, there's no evidence to suggest these individuals were guilty of this heinous crime. The documents relating to these cases were almost always authored by individuals who believed in the guilt of the accused and we know many were tortured into confessing to elaborate stories. For example, early witch trials author, Johannes Nieders, circa 1437 for Macarius, includes reference to a woman's confession allegedly told to him by a judge who oversaw her trial. After having been tortured, the woman is said to have told him, quote, one of the witch's main activities was killing small children, either in their cradles or right in their parents' beds. This was performed so stealthily that the children seemed to have died a natural death, unquote. She continued saying, quote, then we secretly steal them from their graves and cook them in a cauldron until the whole flesh comes away from the bones and becomes a soup that may easily be drunk. And with the liquid, we fill a flask or skin Whoever drinks from this with the addition of a few other rituals immediately acquires much knowledge and becomes a leader in our sect." Unquote. Whether this confession was fabricated by the author or generated under the, the duress of torture, we cannot know. Either way, versions of this disturbing story would be echoed again and again, appearing in influential texts such as the infamous Malleus Maleficarum. Though these tales were more elaborate than those brought against Jews, we can see a similar pattern of behavior at work. The sudden or tragic deaths of children could be explained as the work of demonic forces hiding in plain sight. As a result, innocent people would then find themselves accused of the most deplorable acts imaginable. In his excellent work, The European Witch Hunt, Julian Goodair poignantly comments on this pattern of behavior. Quote, people blame a scapegoat because it is better than doing nothing. He goes on to say, scapegoating has a real social function. It helps people make sense of an unfamiliar and threatening situation and gives them a course of action, unquote. There are other notable similarities between the accusations brought against Jews and witches. For example, both were accused of spreading plague and illness. Beginning in the 12th century, stories began to circulate that Jews poisoned wells, purposely spreading harmful diseases. While these allegations would surface from time to time, these rumors escalated dramatically with the emergence of the Black Plague in Europe. Spread primarily by rodents and fleas, this disease was one of the deadliest in human history. It's estimated that 25 million people died in Europe as a result of the plague approximately 40% of the population. As the plague destroyed community after community, stories claim that Jews and lepers were responsible for the disease as they had allegedly participated in a widespread conspiracy to poison the wells of Europe. According to historian William Brustein, the contemporary myth claimed that, quote, Jews allegedly carried out their misdeed by administering a concoction of spiders, frogs, lizards, excrement, menstrual blood, Christian hearts, and consecrated hosts through secret tunnels that flowed into the wells of Christian Europe, unquote. It's important to note these rumors were not accepted by all. In fact, Pope Clement VI firmly denounced anti-Jewish violence during the plague. Nevertheless, hundreds of Jewish communities were attacked or destroyed across Europe as a result of these allegations. Thousands of Jews were forcibly converted or burned at the stake. We should note this method of execution was used for individuals believed to have committed a variety of heretical offenses. As we know from popular culture, 
those convicted of witchcraft were often burned at the stake in Europe. However, it should be noted, this punishment was not the only method of execution for witches. Individuals condemned as witches were hanged in England and the English colonies. Unlike 14th century Jews, witches were not typically blamed for full-blown pandemics such as the Black Plague. However, those accused of witchcraft were frequently suspected of spreading disease or bringing illness in specific cases. In fact, outbreaks of unexpected sickness were frequently the spark which ignited a witchcraft accusation. Illness might also bolster an already existing witchcraft suspicion. We see this in numerous examples during the Salem witch trials. For example, John Willard, one of the 19 individuals hanged during the Salem witch trials, was accused of causing the illness of two members of his wife's family. After having been named by a member of the community as a possible witch, Willard sought the advice of his grandfather-in-law, Bray Wilkins. Having broken a promise to pray with Willard, Wilkins became convinced his grandson-in-law gave him a malevolent look, the evil eye, causing him to suffer from a urinary tract illness. The spread of disease caused by malevolent magic was just one of the calamities believed to be brought on by witches. Other seemingly random acts of misfortune could be attributed to the work of a witch as well. For example, unusual weather patterns, particularly those that damage crops or disrupted journeys could be blamed on witchcraft. In one particularly famous example, King James VI of Scotland came to fear witchcraft was at work when his fleet was struck by a severe storm while he returned home after collecting his new bride, Anne of Denmark. James would eventually become convinced this was the work of witches from North Berwick, leading to the trial, torture, and execution of at least 70 people, though some estimate this number may be closer to 200. It should perhaps come as no surprise that before the witch trials period, Jews were also accused of causing natural disasters, including earthquakes, rainstorms, and hailstorms. For example, according to 16th century author, Johann Jacob Schul, King Charles V blamed a failed attack on the coast of Algiers on the work of a Jewish magician who he claimed had raised the storm that rerouted his ship. Another fascinating connection are the stories of flying and particularly the vehicle used to achieve flight. We are likely all familiar with the trope that witches fly on broomsticks. However, during the early modern period, there was no consensus as to if or how witches flew. Some claimed witches could not fly, and perhaps those who confessed to this act were tricked into thinking they flew in their dreams. Others claimed witches flew supported by nothing at all. Details of these stories depended on where you were. Some said witches flew on pitchforks. Others said they flew on sticks. In fact, that's the story we see brought up during the Salem Witch Trials. And finally, some said they flew on goats. This particular reference to witches astride a goat provides yet another link between previous story, stories used to disparage Jews. It was common to associate Jews and goats in the medieval period. Though goats had once been seen as a symbol of fertility, they eventually became associated with the devil by Christians. And thus the connection drawn between Jews and goats in early modern art was another visual reminder of Jews presumed connection to the devil. As we see here, both witches and Jews were depicted in contemporary illustrations writing backwards on goats. Perhaps one of the most fascinating connections is the witch's hat. We are frequently asked about the origins of the stereotypical witch here at our museum. Why do witches fly on broomsticks? Why do they cook over a cauldron? Why do they have green skin? Some of these traits have relatively clear roots, as we just noted when discussing the witch's flight, for example. However, a characteristic that we have struggled to understand for many years now is the witch's hat. Unlike the cauldron or the black cat, there's rarely mention of the origin of this archetype in witchcraft historiography. The only mention we have previously come across was the inclusion of an image in Julian Goodair's book, The European Witch Hunt, captioned a Sicilian witch. The British Museum's catalog states that this illustration depicts a witch wearing a conical penitent, a cone-shaped hat worn as a sign of penance, 
decorated with the devil and carrying a long taper. With this information in mind, we wondered if the witch's distinct pointed hat may have originated, originated from a form of penance used for heretics during the Inquisition. Once we began delving into this research, it became apparent that the origins of the witch's hat could potentially be entwined with the history of European anti-Semitism. Beginning in the 11th century, a pointed hat was increasingly used to identify a Jewish figure in medieval art. In her work, Dark Mirror, The Medieval Origins of Anti-Jewish Iconography, historian Sarah Lipton argues this was not initially a reflection of a contemporary style, but Jews would eventually be required to wear various distinguishing items of clothing across Europe, including a pointed hat. In 1215, Pope Innocent III decreed during the, first, the Fourth Lateran Council that Jews and Muslims would be required to wear identifying markers or items of clothing at all times. As the Pope did not specify what markings would be used, they varied across Europe with the size, color, and shape of the badge or item of clothing differing depending on the individual country. For example, in 1275, England adopted the practice requiring Jews over the age of seven to wear a piece of yellow cloth, six fingers long and three wide over the chest of their outermost garment. These badges were intended to be shaped like the 10 commandment tablets. In French territories, the badge was called a rota and was the shape of a circle in red or yellow fabric. In Spain and Italian territories, badges were also usually a yellow circle, though the enforcement of this badge was sporadic. As previously stated, a pointed hat known as the Jewish hat, Judenhut, or Pilius Cornutus was a visual identifier of a Jewish person by the medieval period. Historian Gary Jensen notes, quote, in the 14th century in German and French mystery plays, which were tableau depicting biblical scenes with accompanying Christian chants, Jews were clothed in Jewish garb with a Jew badge and peaked hat, reinforcing the connection between Jews, lust, and Satan for an ever-growing audience. Such plays heightened anti-Jewish sentiment and solidified stereotypes, unquote. Beyond this visual reference, some Jews were required to wear this pointed hat as the clothing item distinguishing them from the Christian population in certain areas of Europe. As observed by historian Sarah Lipton, by 1267, two church councils required Jews to wear pointed hats, and as time went on, pointed hats became signs of Jewishness. We can see several images of these hats here. Some were smaller, with a sharp point and a sort of knob at the top. Others were taller and thinner, more closely resembling the witch hat of today. And here we see another image of this elongated Jewish hat drawn by Spanish artist Francisco Goya in the early 19th century. As we saw in the first illustration, Heretics charged with practicing magic in Sicily were also required to wear this pointed hat in public as a form of penance. We can see another image here showing the execution of Protestants and Jews accused by the Inquisition of practicing heresy and witchcraft. And again, we can see several pointed hats denoting Jews. Historian Brian Levesque notes that by 1421, Hungarian offenders charged with sorcery were required to publicly wear the Jews hat. Now logic follows, there's a connection between the pointed hat worn by Jews, the cone hat worn by heretics, and the notion of the devil in European popular culture. We can therefore make the educated guess that the witch's hat, so commonly associated with this figure today, is likely derived from, or at least strongly influenced by, the pointed hat required to be worn by Jews in the medieval period. Other similar characteristics can be found in artistic depictions of witches and Jews. For example, in the late 13th century, male Jews began to be depicted with hooked noses, a sign which, according to historian Sarah Lipton, denoted sin and moral turpitude. This would eventually become a dominant element of the derogatory Jewish stereotype. As the medieval period wore on, Jews were increasingly described in an unattractive light 
They were said to be malodorous, bearing a distinct smell that could only dissipate after they converted and were depicted with grotesque features such as large hooked noses and warts. Typically, early modern witches were depicted in one of two ways. They were either young, beautiful seductresses or old, haggard monsters. The latter depiction has, of course, remained with the stereotypical witch today. If we look at visuals surrounding Halloween, we often see a witch depicted as an ugly woman with a black pointed hat, a hooked nose, and a large hideous wart. It's interesting to compare some of the derogatory characteristics included in artistic renderings of Jews and witches. Of course, these characteristics were not necessarily meant to inten intentionally link the witch and Jew. They were instead meant to exaggerate the otherness of these individuals, providing visual reminders of their allegedly depraved, undesirable nature. Remnants of this medieval stereotype have remained fixed to the depictions of both Jews and witches for centuries. Here we can see two images just 40 years apart, illustrating how these stereotypical features have, to a certain degree, remained. Due to a combination of factors, including the rise of the Age of Enlightenment and advancements made during the scientific revolution, witch hunts came to an end in the 18th century. The last legal witch execution is thought to have taken place in the Swiss canton of Glarus in 1782. The restoration of Jewish citizenship, civil and political rights began during the same period. This process would continue throughout the 19th century and though Jews were now granted legal civil equality, anti-Semitism and social discrimination remained ever looming throughout Europe. While it's fascinating to compare the similarities between the accusations spread about both Jews and witches centuries ago, these stories have important lessons for us in the modern day. These were libelous tales frequently spread during times of escalated fear, which would have deadly consequences for thousands of innocent people targeted as part of a fictional demonic conspiracy. Unfortunately, the most destructive episode of European anti-Semitism would of course take place in the 1930s and 40s, yet again during a time of increased tension and misfortune. Though the propaganda used by the Nazis now included new elements, many of the allegations and stories used to degrade Jews during the medieval period resurfaced, once again used to dehumanize and scapegoat. This time, the consequences would be nearly unimaginable, resulting in the mass murder of 6 million Jews. Anti-Semitism remains a very real and serious problem to this day. In fact, the Anti-Defamation League reported in March of this year that anti-Semitic incidents increased by 36% in 2022, the largest increase since the ADL began tracking such events in 1979. Assaults were up by 26%, harassment incidents by 29%, and acts of vandalism by 52%. Speaking to the PBS NewsHour earlier this year, Jonathan Greenblatt, CEO and director of the ADL said, quote, not only was 22 the highest number that we have ever seen, and we have done this for almost 45 years, this was the third time in the past four years that we broke a new record, unquote. Musing about the reasons behind the steady increase, Greenblatt went on to say, quote, anti-Semitism has been normalized and almost weaponized in the political conversation and public debates. It's now just common course to use anti-Semitic tropes about great replacement theory, about who controls Congress or who controls Wall Street, who is responsible for COVID and on and on. In a world in which conspiracy theories are the new coin of the realm, anti-Semitism, the oldest conspiracy theory, has new life, unquote. A key contributor to the increase in these events is social media, where anti-Semitism is spread on a daily basis. Anti-Semitism is found in schools from kindergarten to college. Politicians, sports figures, and celebrities like Ye and Kyrie Irving, for example, use their platforms to express anti-Semitism mainstreaming and legitimizing conspiracy theories to their followers. Greenblatt spoke about combating the growing problem. Quote, 
everyone needs to be involved because anti-Semitism isn't just a Jewish problem, just like racism isn't just a problem of black people or homophobia about LGBTQ people. Anti-Semitism is everyone's problem. It's a universal concern, unquote. Jonathan Greenblatt's last comment reminds us of the famous quote from Martin Niemöller, Lutheran pastor and German nationalist who spent the last seven years of Nazi rule in concentration camps. Quote, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out for me. Sadly, looking back at 78 years of American history since World War II, there has never been a time without anti-Semitism. While anti-Semitic beliefs continue to be deeply held by some, we can see numerous cases over the last century where these prejudicial ideas are used for political expediency. Take for example, Wisconsin Senator Joe McCarthy, who is infamous for his attack without evidence on alleged communists in the State Department and beyond in the 1950s. A little known episode of his career includes his defense of German soldiers who killed American POWs in 1944. A fascinating 2020 article by Larry Tai in Smithsonian Magazine entitled, When Senator Joe McCarthy Defended Nazis, describes the Malmedy Belgium massacre and the war crimes trial that followed, resulting in a death sentence for 43 German soldiers and life sentences for 22 more. Taking an unpopular stand, McCarthy and others flipped the story, claiming the United States was out for vengeance and tortured the German defendants, while, quote, casting as malefactors the army investigators, prosecution team, and military tribunal, unquote. Why did McCarthy take this stand? While he may have been genuinely, genuinely concerned that the Germans were being mistreated after the war, as he was partially German himself and represented a large German constituency in Wisconsin, quote, a more troubling theory popular with his critics holds that McCarthy's actions regarding Malmedy were driven by anti-Semitism. As evidence, they pointed to his casual and frequent use of anti-Jewish slurs which even his closest friends acknowledged to biographers, unquote. There were other events in McCarthy's political life when he fixated on Jewish figures, but he also was, as Ty points out, an opportunist. Quote, the Wisconsin senator didn't have it in for Jews specifically any more than he did gays, pinkos, East Coast intellectuals, Wall Street mavens, Washington insiders, political journalists, or anyone else he disdained and could vilify to score political points. Scapegoating is part of every bully's playbook and it's why McCarthy became the archetype for demagogues who came after him, unquote. Old and new stories continue to circulate, directing anger and fear at Jews. The deep state conspiracy, which emerged in 2017, accuses its enemies of child abuse and cannibalism, charges lodged against Jews and witches for centuries. Said Kevin Roos in a 2020 New York Times article, this conspiracy, quote, operates in a different way and at a different scale than anything we've seen before. It's one thing to have a polarized political discourse with heated disagreements. It's another to have a faction of Americans who think with complete sincerity that the leaders of the opposition party are kidnapping and cannibalizing children, unquote. Yet again, we see the same old stories used to demonize one's enemies. There are many other false allegations circulating today. Conspiracy theories about the Federal Reserve. Arthur McEwen, professor of economics at UMass Boston notes, quote, while I'm sure there are many decent people who see the Fed and the bankers as the source of the world's problems, this view is often part of a larger anti-Semitism. The focus on Jewish financiers, the Rothschilds, for example, as the source of our economic and other problems is as old as it is wrong and offensive, unquote. And of course, there's COVID. So as we already mentioned, Jews and witches were accused of spreading disease. 
It is perhaps no surprise flyers were distributed in at least eight states last year, claiming Jews controlled all aspects of the COVID response. Quote, this is another reminder that the Jewish community is a target in the United States, CEO of the Secure Community Network, Michael Masters said. Quote, there continue to be groups willing to do anything they can to attack Jewish people, including blaming them for a pandemic that has affected so many lives across the globe. Now, of course, hate crimes against Asian Americans also skyrocketed during the pandemic, as these individuals were also blamed for spreading the disease. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, please see our earlier lecture, Hidden History, Japanese Internment, and Other Asian American Witch Hunts. These are truly difficult, divisive, and disturbing times. It's only by learning about these events and their enduring similarities to the modern day that we can hope to stop them from repeating over and over. As Jonathan Friedland said in a 2018 article in The Guardian, quote, remember, anti-Semitism differs from other racisms in its belief that Jews are the secret masters of the universe, pulling the strings that shape world events and always for the sake of evil. Conspiracy theory, fake news, demonization of an unpopular group, what happens to our politics if all these become the norm? This is why Jews have often functioned as the canary in the coal mine. When a society turns on its Jews, it is usually a sign of wider ill health, unquote. So that is the end of our presentation. We have back the sources page uh, in case you'd like to take a picture or jot down some of these titles. Uh, all of them are really excellent resources for learning about uh, anti-Semitism throughout history. And we've also got a couple of books about the European witch trials that specifically uh, speak to the connections with uh, medieval anti-Semitism. Uh, so now I'm going to open up the chat and we have a couple of questions for, uh, or we have a couple of minutes for questions. So I see this in, an intriguing question about King Arthur. No idea. And I don't know. So the question is in King Arthur's legends, Arthur turned to a wizard sorcerer named Merlin for advice. Merlin is seen as a positive advisor and mentor in Camelot. Was this a modern adaptation? So my understanding of this is that, so the King Arthur legends are long before the witch trials. So there's this kind of, it's important to make the distinction of, there's a long history of people being believed to be sorcerers and uh, practitioners of magic. That is not the same as being believed to be a witch in the early modern witch trials sense. That is a time when it shifts and it becomes demonic. Uh, so I can't say that I'm that familiar with the early, you know, the original versions of the Arthurian legends, but that would seem correct to me. I don't, I wouldn't imagine at that time he's being demonized in that way because that's not a trope that exists yet. So we know anti-Semitism is in England, certainly, because yep. the Guardian was writing about it. Um, I think it is uh, around the world. So the question is, is anti-Semitism also increasing in other countries? We really focused our lecture on America, but unfortunately, I'm fairly sure. I think that there's been some issues in Germany recently as well with yes. neo-Nazis. Yep. Um, and then do you think there's a parallel between increased anti-Semitism and the decline in Christianity in this country? Can't really speak no idea. to that, but it's, an, it's interesting to ponder. So then we say, see, thank you for your research and presentation. This disturbing behavior of othering continues. What thoughts do you have for people on what people can do to help stand up against the demonization of others, of othering individuals and groups in the way you have historically described? What a great question. And really the best we can do is look at the roots of accusations. And so I guess this is two part. It's education. It's making sure that we're aware of what uh, these trends are. Becoming educated about patterns in history is so important. Uh, because we can then recognize those same stories when they come up. Uh, and then it's also being able to kind of, it helps us be able to recognize um, when something doesn't quite seem right and uh, then helps us to guide our actions from there. And also speaking up, you know, yeah. if you see it in your own life, someone saying something that is clearly anti-Semitic or othering of people, speak up. It's the silence that allows these things to carry on. 
And they may not be aware that what they're saying is anti-Semitic or is an example of othering. Uh, so yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with that of making them aware is another huge element. Proudly other here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, speak up, call others out on their unacceptable behavior, educate them. Beautifully yeah. said. Yeah. Speak up and align with the person being othered. Absolutely. Yeah. Do we have any other questions or just comments for discussion? We covered it all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this the is the history a, of the world, the history of anti-Semitism <laughs> and witchcraft yeah. in, in 45 minutes, minutes or less. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, this was, as we said, um, Thank you, one of the most challenging lectures we've put together because it's just so dense. Uh, and also diving into medieval anti-Semitism was new for us, but um, it's really an important subject. Um, so we have the question, do you think representation of witches is anti-Semitic? No, no, I don't think so. No. Um, so we're not saying that one directly influenced the other. It's not a copy and paste of the tropes of Jews get copied and pasted into witches. I don't think it would ever have been that intentional. Uh, it's just that it's interesting to note that in terms of others, you see a lot of overlap. So in visual representations, there is overlap. Um, as we said, though, is that overlap intentionally to connect Jews and witches? Almost certainly not. Uh, it's just that they are spoken about in very similar terms. So naturally they would be depicted in kind of similar ways, but there are important distinctions between the way that Jews are represented, the way witches are represented, the way that they're both discussed. Um, so, so that famous quote by Niemöller, where is it from? You know, he spoke, he said it. I don't know if he wrote it in a book. I'm not really sure when they came for me, there was, no one to speak for me is a very famous quote from World War II. Um, but I don't know, you know, when he said it. It's just come down through history as probably the best. And Lutheran, I remember I said that to you how anti Semitic Lutherans were, and you said everybody's anti Semitic. At different times. At we different mean time, in yeah, the yeah. medieval period, yeah. not the medieval period, yeah. the early modern period. Yeah, there's a long period of time. And also today. Yeah. People who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Absolutely. That's kind of the alternative title of this lecture, right? People who don't know history. And it's what we do every day. You know, we, we, we teach the Salem witch trials because it's history repeats and repeats and repeats. And we have to do our best to educate people. So in regards to this comment that's just come up, we try as an institution to remain out of modern political discourse. Um, so we just encourage you to think about what we've said and think about how it applies to what you're seeing happen right now and make that judgment. Uh, our role is to inform, give the tools with facts, with yeah. facts and ask our visitors and our audiences to then draw their own conclusions. So we'll give it one more minute if anybody has any additional questions or just wants to make a comment. Thank you all so much for coming at six o'clock on a Thursday. You are the top. <laughs> Alrighty. Thank well, you very much. Thank everybody. you, everybody. This was a wonderful um, experience. You know, we learned so we learned so much. So um, this will be posted Thanks tomorrow. That, yeah. This will be posted tomorrow on our YouTube and website. Uh, for if you want to share it to other people or you just want to watch it all over again. Um, names. And our names are, uh, my name is Rachel Chris Doan. I'm the director of education here. And I'm Jill Christensen, the assistant director. All right. So with that, thank you all for coming and I hope you have a great rest of your night.